Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And sorry, we're starting a little bit late, but we're going to go ahead and get started right now. Um, thank you so much again for joining us today for Segregation Stress Syndrome from Emmett Till to Trayvon Martin. A uh, quick plug before we begin, if you are a tweeter, please join us at, eight, at HMPRG or hashtag Illinois ACES and let us know what you're thinking. Please follow along. My name is Madison Hammett, and I am a policy analyst with the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative at Help in Medicine. And we are so honored today to have Dr. Ruth Thompson Miller join us to discuss her work surrounding intergenerational trauma's impact on Black Americans and the lasting legacy of Jim Crow. There we go. For those of us who are joining for the first time, uh, a little bit about Health and Medicine. Health and Medicine Policy Research Group works to promote social justice and challenge inequities in health and healthcare. We're an independent policy center here in Chicago that conducts research, educates, and collaborates with other groups to advocate for policies and impact health systems to improve the health status of all people. And then the program within Health and Medicine that is uh, running this webinar today is the Illinois ACEs Response Collaborative. Health and Medicine is the lead convener of the collaborative, which is a multidisciplinary group that utilizes the science of ACEs and childhood trauma in an effort to create critical transformation to policy and practice aligned with current research. The collaborative is a backbone organization, and we act as a mobilizer, convener, and advocate to create systems level change. You can visit our website for more information and for materials like policy briefs, environmental scans of trauma-informed programs, and research surrounding ACEs and other trauma. You can also find our webinars that we've held in the past and sign up for our newsletter, which we hope you will do. And we'd also like to take this time to thank uh, our funders who support this webinar series, including the Illinois Children's Healthcare Foundation, the Otho S.A. Sprague Memorial Institute, the Telogen Community Initiative, Prince Charitable Trust, and the Albert Pick Jr. Fund. We will have time for questions at the end, so please type those in the chat box throughout the webinar. I'll be monitoring that and uh, passing them along to Dr. Thompson Miller at the end. And then uh, very quickly before we begin, oh, excuse me, I'm skipping ahead here. After the webinar, you're going to receive an evaluation survey, ways to participate in the collaborative, links again to some of those materials I mentioned, and you will be receiving a link to the recording of the webinar as well. Before we begin, though, I want to um, talk very quickly about uh, the purpose behind this webinar and our work into historical and collective trauma. Um, while the collaborative was born out of a desire to develop knowledge and propel action around adverse childhood experiences, we do want to acknowledge that ACEs are only a small part of the expanding field of research around trauma. The collaborative has dedicated itself to highlighting the impact that collective, historical, and systemic trauma, such as racism, displacement, and poverty, has had on the lives of both individuals and the communities they live in, and these influences that can and the influences that can happen on long-term health and social outcomes. We've previously had some webinars on related topics, which you can, again, find on our website, um, things like uh, community resilience and uh, the connection uh, between the opioid epidemic and domestic violence in indigenous communities. Uh, we're also working with partners across the state of Illinois to encourage trauma-informed legislation to address historical and systemic inequities that have led to a high rate of trauma in marginalized communities. So as our understanding of trauma expands beyond the individual, not only here at the collaborative, but throughout the research field, we will likewise continue to expand our work surrounding collective and historical trauma. We uh, encourage, again, for you to visit our website for more resources. And then in light of the topic that we'll be discussing today, and out of respect to you, our audience members, who are all joining us with your own backgrounds and experiences with trauma, I do want to take this time for a content warning. Uh, this webinar will include uh, discussions, images, and video footages of some topics that could be upsetting to audience members, and these include things like physical assault, sexual assault and rape, lynchings, images of the Ku Klux Klan, violence against children, and police violence against adults and children. So we want to encourage you all to participate in a way that feels healthy and safest for you. 
The comment box at the side of your screen is open if you have any immediate concerns during the presentation, and you're always welcome to reach out to me at mhammett at hmtrg.org. Finally, I would like to introduce our speaker, who I am just so excited to um, introduce. Uh, Dr. Ruth Thompson Miller is a visiting associate professor of sociology at Vassar College. Her research specializations are race and ethnicity, mental illness, and the elderly. She's received the American Sociological Association National Institute of Mental Health Minority Fellowship, and she is the co-author of chapters in numerous journals, as well as four books, including Jim Crow's Legacy, The Lasting Impact of Segregation, and Black Lives Matter, Please Don't Shoot, Children, Police, Violence, and Trauma. So, Dr. Thompson Miller, I am going to switch the screen over to you and give you control, and you will be able to take it away. Okay. Let's see. Some of this stuff so, so bear with us. This always takes a couple of minutes to catch up. So, okay. Can, can you see my screen? There I go. should be on the screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Madison. Um, I hope the sound is okay. We had a little technical problem earlier on, but I hope we've cleared it up enough so that you folks can hear me. Because I, I really want to thank you for coming out today and participating in this webinar. I think it's some really important information, and I hope that everybody will walk away with something that they find useful, especially as we are still dealing with a lot of the issues that folks who live during Jim Crow um, experience and, and the ways in which that stuff is getting passed on. So throughout the webinar, what I'm going to be doing, in as much as I'll be talking about Jim Crow, uh, a system of racial oppression that uh, ended a number of years ago, what you're going to see, and I'm going to point out for you, a lot of the similarities of what folks who lived through that era experienced resurfacing today in contemporary times. Like I say, Jim Crow um, um, is still the same old Jim Crow he just has on a new set of clothes. And that's what I'm going to be trying to show you today. So the, the, the first thing that I want to um, talk about uh, uh, is I want to just talk about Jim Crow as, as generally as a system of racial oppression. It lasted for quite a number of years and it actually um, uh, uh, it was, you know, followed uh, many, many years of slavery, uh, black codes, uh, and things of that nature. It was a system in which uh, people talk about the whole notion of separate but equal. Uh, during that um, uh, era, it certainly wasn't a system that was equal. Uh, and what was really important about that era is what people experienced racial violence each and every day of their lives. Uh, no matter what they did or where they went, there was always a possibility that they were going to come up against something. And what happened during that time uh, is that they experienced trauma on levels that even as a researcher who thought I knew a thing or two about what went on during Jim Crow, when I went out into the field, I found out things that I had never could have imagined. And I'm going to share some of that uh, with you today. So one of the things that I wanted to do in this research project, this research project that I did in terms of Jim Crow, uh, was um, a part of my PhD dissertation. Uh, it's the book, the Jim Crow's Legacy, as a result of the research that I did. Uh, and what I'm going to share with you at, when I go into contemporary stuff as well is what has prompted me to really do this new, this fourth book that I'm working on in terms of children and their interaction with police officers. So I went out in the field initially to just find out how people coped with Jim Crow. What are some of the strategies that they use? And if they pass those strategies on to the next generation, what I ended up finding out was they were passing on some coping strategies, but they were also passing on trauma that they had experienced. Uh, the methodology was, uh, I'm going to go through these initial slides pretty quickly uh, because I want to get to kind of like the heart of, of this, this uh, webinar. Uh, I Dr. did um, many, many. Dr. Thompson Miller, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, we're having uh, some folks say that they're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Do you uh, mind uh, increasing the audio, uh, your volume a little bit? It, or? It's, my audio is up as, as far as I can get it. Um, hold on a second. Uh, if I put it on speaker, would that help? I, I, we can certainly How's try. That? How's that? Is that better? You sound, you sound good on my end. Folks uh, who were writing into the comments saying they were having a little bit trouble, if you can tell me if y'all are 
they're saying it's better. Yeah. So okay. thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. All right, and folks, I really apologize, and thank you so much for being patient. I tell my students all the time, I got a PhD in sociology, not technology, so <laughs> I always, always come up with some issues with this technological stuff, so thank you for bearing with me. All right, so the methodology that I used was I did uh, uh, nearly 100 interviews with folks who lived through Jim Crow. Uh, uh, some of them happened in the, um, the Southwest and some in the, the Southeast. Um, uh, folks were doctors, lawyers, teachers, domestic workers, and most of the folks that I interviewed were women, and that's kind of representative of what goes on in society where women uh, uh, tend to live longer and are able in, in several settings and several, several ways able to, you know, express what they, they live through. So the interview setting, I conducted them in, in their homes where they felt comfortable and safe, and I put comfortable and safe in quotes, because to a certain degree, these folks didn't even feel safe in their own homes. And once I get to the presentation, you'll understand what I mean by that. The interviews lasted about an hour, open-ended questions, and I really tried to give people the ability to really just share some of the things that they had uh, had lived through. Um, some of the key findings in uh, the research were people who talked about rapes, attempted rapes, they talked about lynchings. They talked about loss of land, um, daily instances of unprovoked violence. And, and, and that's key, this being unprovoked. So you never knew where an attack would come through just in basically just walking down the street. Uh, and there was institutional trauma and betrayal. That institutional betrayal is used because this is state-sponsored terror that they were experiencing at the hands of police, just everyday citizens. And they had no protection from the from the from the state. Whereas the police was supposed to be there to protect you to a certain degree, and we see some of that even playing out today. And here we go with some of these connections, okay? And so I talk about segregation stress syndrome. It's this collective PTSD based upon these traumatic events. Now, a traumatic event is this threat to life or physical integrity. It's outside of a person's normal experiences. Um, uh, it could be a single event, you know, an accident or a disaster, which is what most people to a certain degree deal with. But there's this long-standing, repeated trauma that people experience during Jim Crow, abuse, torture, and living in this combat-like experiences where some people might say it was kind of like a, a war zone because you never knew where it was coming from. And the trauma didn't necessarily have to be something that you experienced yourself. It could be witnessing some traumatic event, experiencing yourself, or even just hearing about it could lead to symptoms of post-traumatic stress syndrome. And that's been documented. Some of the reactions to um, this long-standing, uh, these long-standing traumatic events included um, uh, exhibiting feelings of rage. Uh, there was a lot of shame that went on with not being able to protect yourself and to protect your family. Uh, there was anger that wasn't able to be expressed because expressing your anger could lead to all sorts of, of additional, additional violence. And I'm going to talk about that later in terms of, you know, controlling the ways in which you respond emotionally to stuff when you're in the middle of it. It's this, this term called emotional labor. We actually really have to control the ways in which you respond because responding in particular ways could lead to even more, more trauma and more violence. Uh, people had feelings of fear and guilt. And some of the ways that they coped was denial of what happened to them. Uh, a lot of people talked about, you know, God and spirituality and how that helped them get through it. Um, some people resisted, but re resistance came other types of consequences, which you're going to see as well. And just being obedient, really trying to do everything that you were asked to do and, 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 and respond in ways that didn't lead to more violence. But being obedient didn't, didn't guarantee you, guarantee you uh, any degree of safety as well. So it was really, it was really kind of just, kind of a haphazard kind of kind of thing because you never really knew. And that's one of the things I think that also added to the stress and um, uh, ways in which uh, folks of color who live through this, this system, you know, it really impacted their, their, their physical 
physical health because we know that stress and chronic stress and, and, and continuous stress really does shorten our lives. And we see that in the data where folks of color live a lot less years than folks who don't have brown or black skin. So segregation stress syndrome is a term that I came up with. And I have to tell you, I went out into the field and I was interviewing people and the ways in which they were responding physically. And I, I watched it and it, it gnawed at me. I, I, I could see that I was missing something. And what I realized I was missing that these folks were suffering from collective PTSD. So it's the chronic enduring extremely painful responses to collective trauma that occurred during Jim Crow. It's similar to PTSD in some aspects. However, it's based on a collective experience of African Americans during a particular time. It includes physical reactions such as sweating, avoiding of events, places, and people that remind individuals of the trauma, and it consists of this intergenerational transmission of trauma. I had people talk about the fact that they they break out into sweats when they see bus, school buses, because of some of the experiences they had as children. People not drinking out of water fountains, uh, people not going to particular stores where a traumatic event happened. So even though it's 50, 60 years after these folks experiences this, they still get triggered in ways that um, I could not uh, have imagined. Um, they have a, a lot of fear. Uh, several people during the interview process had to be reassured several times that their names wouldn't be connected because you got to keep in mind Jim Crow ended a while ago, but a lot of these folks who experienced the trauma are still living and the folks that inflicted it on them are still living as well. So there's a certain degree of fear that the data will be connected with them and they'll still suffer some sort of um, a retaliation for even speaking about it. Folks talked about having flashbacks, trouble sleeping, intrusive memories, you know, memories that would just come up uh, out of nowhere and, and um, based upon some trigger, like I said, avoidance of stores, water fountains, and, and buses. There's a certain hypervigilance, like I said, you know, people, and I put this in quote, you know, black paranoia, uh, which is framed negatively by society, but in actuality for folks who live through this, it was it was the right thing to do to be paranoid about the ways in which they were going to have interactions with, with, with white folks in uh, particular. Uh, uh, folks feeling the need to warn their children and grandchildren uh, about the individuals that inflicted the trauma on them. And here's that intergenerational transmission. That's how it gets passed on. And the memories for these folks were triggered by symbols of Jim Crow, police brutality, uh, voting restrictions, which we're still dealing with today in contemporary times, lack of educational opportunity, schools, are more segregated now than they were during the Jim Crow era. So we can see that not much has changed for these folks. So this whole notion that we're post-racial and the fact that we've come a long way to a certain degree in some aspects we have, but at the same time, for so the folks who survived this, they see that not much really has changed for them, and particularly for their children and grandchildren. And this notion that the, the lack of consequences for offenders that inflict racial violence on people as individuals and as a collective group. And we see that here again with the ways in which people, you know, kill people, you know, injure children, you know, leave people lying in the street, and there's no consequences uh, for these people. Um, uh, so the symptoms vary based upon the severity of the experience, the time of the earliest exposure, the length and frequency of it, um, and the severity of witnessing a racial traumatic event. Like I said, it includes sweating, crying, shaking, and trembling. Uh, people would be emotionally upset when recalling the event from the past. And there were some people who had an emotional numbness about them where you could kind of see in their eyes that they had kind of shut down. Um, and, and it was concerning for me in, on, on several levels. And there were times when I asked people if they wanted to stop. I mean, some people were crying and shaking to the point where I was really concerned for their well-being, but they constantly told me, and I heard this more than not, I want to talk about this. I want people to understand what I went through and what we dealt with, because there's a lot of misconception that it was really just about everything being separate, but it was so much more than that, and people need to know. 
And and um, since I've done this project and um, interviewed these people, a lot of these people have passed away. So the people who hold these stories are passing away, and it's just really important that if they could live through this stuff as human beings, if human rights were being violated daily, then I can talk about it, and we can listen to it, and we can acknowledge the fact that they lived through something. It was in 2008, and I need to mention this real quickly, that the, on the Senate floor, they actually apologized for slavery and Jim Crow segregation. Didn't make a lot of news. It was kind of a lukewarm kind of apology. And a lot of people don't even know that they gave and give, uh, you know, on the Senate floor, that they gave an official apology for slavery and Jim Crow. Again, this notion that the lives of black people don't matter is some people that is something that black folks do not miss. The grandparents of these children, who I'm going to talk about later on, don't miss the fact that they realize that just like in Jim Crow, their bodies didn't matter them, and the bodies of their children are under some of the same assault that they saw when they were coming up during Jim Crow. That's a key point. It's a key point. So segregation stress under the reality that you're unable to protect yourself or your family members in dangerous situations. Again, this underlying fear that your family could be killed or harmed. Uh, it includes institutional trauma and cultural trauma. And with each generation, there's a continuum of chronic stress that doesn't allow the collective group to recover. So with post-traumatic stress syndrome, and a lot of the data that I, I got about this intergenerational transmission is through Holocaust survive, survivor uh, data and, and, and literature. And the thing about that is, is with, with Holocaust survivors, they went through something that was horrific, and that needs to be, you know, noted. Uh, and at the same time, at some point it ended, and they were able to, to a certain degree, have some healing. For folks of color, African Americans in this, in this society, it has not ever ended. There has been no reprieve, you know, the stress, the trauma, and the fear of death uh, for themselves and their children is relentless. And I think that's a key point of segregation stress syndrome that's different than post-somatic post stress syndrome. It doesn't end for, 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 for African Americans. So this first quote, um, and I'm going to send Madison a sheet with some of these quotes on it, and I'm, because we started a little bit late. I'm going to just talk about some of these. Um, this is uh, one, this woman, I interviewed her. I interviewed her in her home. And one thing that I noticed, because one thing about doing these interviews and doing research is you, you, you look at the total picture, this holistic view. And so when I went into her home, her home, it was pitch black. The blinds were drawn. It was really dark. She wouldn't let me tape record her, so I had to really try to write down what she was saying. It was, um, the TV was the only light that I had uh, in order to write stuff down. And she had to be reassured constantly that nobody would know that it was her, um, that they wouldn't find out that she spoke to me, um, and that she should feel safe in sharing what she wanted to share. And this is what she said to me. She talked about her first experience, how she went to school, you know, not to school, how she went to work with her mom. And we think about nowadays how, you know, you have take your child to work day. So I equate this with take your child to work day, but the experience that she had traumatized her for the, for the rest of her, her life. So she said, um, my mother would wash clothes from Mr. Smith back when I was 16. I would help my mother by using an iron to press the clothes. He always wanted his shirt clean and pressed. Back then, you didn't have bleach. You had to use lye. We used a washing board to scrub the clothes. I remember one day, I, I don't know what happened, but there was one spot on the corner of his collar, and he started cussing. He just kept cussing and yelling at my mama. I was so scared for my mama. She just kept saying, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. She was begging and pleading with him. And I remember that being my first memory. Now, just think about that for a minute. 
This woman is in her 70s. Uh, she's sitting in this dark tomb. And the thing that she remembers the most is, was this day that she went to work with her mom. Something that is a joyous thing for most people. You're, you're proud to go to work with your mom. But as a result of it, this man got so angry because of this one spot. And the, the, the thought that he could hurt her and her mother, kill them, beat them up, do anything to them, was something that was really, was really, really real. And as she related to me, I could see the, the pain in her face, and I can only imagine, you know, what it would have been like for this young woman going to work with her mom and having this man be act the way that he did about something on his shirt. This was a daily occurrence for folks, and she never really got over it. And you could see, if you could see her face, you would see um, the ways in which it impacted her. Um, and a lot of these folks, and, and I'll talk about this later on, they never sought any kind of um, mental health care. Uh, some folks who talked about going talked about the fact that, you know, they went and they won't believe and uh, they got the feeling that, you know, the, the, the person that was there that was supposed to be helping them uh, made it seem as if, you know, they were just being paranoid. And all of those things are really important because you have one opportunity when you have these folks in front of you to do what you can to help them have a better life and help them to deal with some of the trauma that they're experiencing. And it's really important as clinicians and folks who see these folks to make sure that that opportunity, you grab it and you, you make them feel safe, respected, understood, so that they'll come back and get the help that they need because these traumatic events Untended to, in terms of mental health care, leads to all sorts of physical um, um, ailments and mental ailments that 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 really diminish the quality of people's lives. And that's a really key point for me, and one of the reasons why I do this, because I've seen I've seen what happens to young folks who experience this stuff and it doesn't get handled when they're in their 70s and 80s. And what we're seeing with these young black children who are dealing with these interactions with police is a precursor to what their lives could look like in 60, 70 years. And that's why and how I'm making these connections. And I think it's really important. So the next quote um, is one in which a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, several people talked about you know, you know, rapes and attempted rapes, but the, the, the raping of, of black women during slavery and Jim Crow is pretty well documented. But a number of people who talked about, you know, these rapes, talked about it with other people's families, like, you know, so-and-so got raped or this person got raped. They never really associated it with, you know, what happened in their family. And here goes this whole notion of the shame of it all. You know, one of the things that you were, were, were taught and socialize as men is to be able to protect our women, to be able to protect our wives, to be able to protect our children, uh, particularly our female children. And during the era of Jim Crow, that was something that wasn't, didn't happen for, for black men in a, in a, in a huge way. And um, uh, a lot of people talk about the fact that sometimes men would leave, leave the women uh, sometimes men knew that the children weren't theirs, but they still stayed. And I mean, if you, you think about that in terms of families and black families and this whole notion of black, black families being fragile and broken, if you look at the data of what happened during those times, you kind of get a sense of not so much broken, but they were dealing with the consequences of what other people did to them in the best way that they could. And like I said, a lot of men did stay, but there were men who left. So this young woman, um, uh, she was in her 70s as well. She talked about one afternoon where her and her family had just come home from church. And she said, um, uh, I, I remember one Sunday afternoon, a, a white man came to our house. I must have been about 15. And this man knocked on the door. And my mom was sleeping. And my brother was in the next room sleeping. I answered the door. The man looked like he was spellbound, and it frightened me. So I started backing up, and he started following me. He went straight through my mom's bedroom and my brother's bedroom, and I ran, and he was following me. My brother sat up in the bed to see what was happening. He came behind me. I can remember my sister saying, oh, no, no, Richard. No, no, Richard. 
because he was going to hurt him. I ran up under the house and hid. He walked in the yard looking for me, and eventually he went on and got in the car. My dad wanted to know who it was. I was never able to tell him who he was. I couldn't remember telling him what he looked like. It frightened me. I was young, and it frightened me. I knew that these things happened, and I didn't want it to happen to me. It was terrible. It was very frightening. My brother wouldn't have been able to do anything about it. That's huge. You're in your own home. You come home after being in church on, on you know, it's a Sunday afternoon. People are in their bed sleeping. He opens the door, and this white man just comes in the house. So this whole notion of being safe and comfortable in your own home wasn't something that was afforded to uh, African Americans during the era of Jim Crow, right? And so reason why people have their shades closed is because they don't really want folks on the outside to see what's going on on the inside because someone could come into your home and do something to you, rape you, beat you, kill you, and there wasn't anything that you could do about it. There was no recourse in the judicial system for, for folks of color uh, during this era. Now, something I need to mention, this young man, Richard, was a very outspoken person. He really was involved in in being in being um, active in resisting the system of Jim Crow. And many years later, and she talked about this, and she really broke down, um, they found him uh, in a refrigerator. Someone had murdered him, put him in a refrigerator, and dumped his body in a, a local lake. It devastated the mother and this woman. But you can see that there are consequences for resisting the system that's being supported institutionally and structurally by a society. You know, there were consequences for him speaking out. You know, he lost his, his life. And it just, uh, it, 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 it destroyed really the, the entire family. And we can see the beginnings of it when he's trying to go after this man who's trying to sexually assault his sister and his older sister was the one that pulled him off and said, you couldn't do anything because if you did anything to protect her, everybody could lose their life. They could burn the house down. And folks knew that there weren't any consequences for people who did stuff like this. And one thing I want to point out about this is, you know, there's this, this, these stereotypes and these notions about black women's bodies and about women being sexualized and, you know, objectified. And one of the things that a lot of people did when they talked about these women who were violated, they talked about, you know, her morality. You know, some of the people talked about, you know, she was a good girl. You know, she went to church. Here we talk about, you know, uh, this one person talked about, it was a man who talked about this woman, Elizabeth Smith, where she was kidnapped, raped, and sodomized. And he talked about the fact that the men never served a day in jail. Uh, she wasn't married or anything, and she was a sanctified church-going girl, right? So there's always this notion of kind of, you know, uh, um, uh, talking about women in a way to let you know that nobody deserves to be, be raped, no matter how you decide to live your life, but they always seem like they wanted to make sure that you knew that these were good women who were being, who were being violated. And this is a term that some people use. They talk about uh, kitchen babies, you know, and the trauma of, of rape. Now, I'm going to read this one because I think it's really important because there's a lot of things going on in this. And one thing that I think is really important is that we don't understand the ramifications of what happens to some of these young girls when they get raped by these men and they get pregnant. The onus of, you know, um, uh, saying that a person raped you is one thing, but then what you do with the baby and how it impacts your, your life is a whole other thing. And, and Joe Fagan, uh, my mentor, talks about this unjust impoverishment and unjust enrichment. And you see a lot of that going on during Jim Crow, where, you know, you, you a person rapes you, you have to leave town, you have to go out of town and raise the baby. And that causes this unjust impoverishment, where you lose your social support, you lose your, your you know, your family support, you lose the support of your community, and you're actually shunned and have to leave in shame uh, because of something that you really had no control over. When you're actually the victim, but you're treated like um, it was something that you asked for. And so this woman talks about the fact um, uh, in later years, uh, my mother and her sisters would tell uh, 
they wouldn't tell us anything about what happened to her cousin. I'm not going to read it because I, I I know that I'm running out of time, and I want to make sure that I leave you t- give you time for questions. So they talk about the fact that she had to leave town. This this white man raped her. They knew who it was. The the family went and said something to him, but the people in the town said that she was the one that had to leave. And so there's this term kitchen babies that black folk use for all these women who had men who come into their house selling ice or selling something or who would just come in and would rape these women. A lot of families deny that that's what happened. But if you if you look at a lot of these families back in the South, you'll see, you'll see that um, there was um, something uh, going on. Because when you have men and women who are of a certain complexion, and then you have a child that's biracial, for the most part, you know that there was a, a white man um, that came in and um, uh, took advantage of these women and, and raped them. And I have to, you know, I tell my students all the time, just just call it like it is. You know, it, it means to use the words to explain what really happened is really important because we have a tendency, and I have to say in this country, of trying to use words that don't really relay the magnitude of what has really happened uh, to these folks. And so I'm going to use the words that I think are applicable to what people really went through. I mean, I have to do that in all fairness to them. Um, so part of this whole notion of these black women being raped is this destruction of black masculinity, where black men, even though you're socialized to protect your women, you couldn't. This woman here, Ruby McCullum, there's a major motion picture coming out about her. And this is Sam Adams who uh, was elected uh, in Florida to the Senate. Uh, And one day um, she went into his office and um, she shot him four times and and killed him because she had had enough. She had, she was married. She was one of the wealthiest women in Swanee County. Uh, Her and her husband ran a Belito business. That's the number of the lottery of today. But even being the richest woman in Swanee County couldn't protect her from being raped by Dr. Adams and being forced to have his child. She had one child by him. Her husband, Sam, stayed with her. Um, um, uh, But then she had, she was pregnant with another child. She wanted to get rid of it. Doc Adams wouldn't do it. And so she shot him dead in his office. Huge case. They didn't lynch her because if they had lynched her, it would have made national news. And it would have shined a light on what was going on you know, in Swanee County in Florida. And she talked about in her testimony, she actually went on trial. Um, uh, she talked about him raping her, beating her, drugging her. He forced her to have his children. Um, and she was forced to choose between her husband, Sam, and, and, and him. Um, I actually interviewed, there's a couple documentaries that I participated in, You Belong to Me, and on investigative discovery, it's called The Shot Doctor. And they do a really good job of explaining how everything played out with Sam and and Ruby. And like I said, nobody went unscathed. Nobody was protected. Having all the money in the world couldn't protect you uh, from some of this stuff. And she's uh, she's proof of that. Um, She went on trial. They found her guilty. Uh, By time she placed an appeal, she had deteriorated to the point where she couldn't go through another trial. So they put her in a mental institution for over 20 years, and when she finally got out, she lived a few years, uh, and she died. Uh, the, the, the child that she had with Doc Adams and the two children that she had with Sam lived somewhere in New Jersey. They refused to talk to people about their mother. They promised her before she passed away that they wouldn't talk about, you know, how everything played out uh, with her and uh, Dr. Adams. On another aspect of it, the day after she shot and killed Dr. Adams, her son, Sam, who they said had heart trouble, uh, ended up dead. And so because they were running this Bolito business, there were a lot of people that participated in getting money from that, including Dr. Adams, which helped him to uh, get his seat, you know, in the Senate. He had just been newly elected but never served the day because she shot him uh, on a sunny afternoon in Swanee County of Florida. Uh, in his office. So there's some black historical newspaper. This is one of the ways in which I found out some of the information about folks that uh, young people that were raped. So these rapes that occurred, some of these children were just that, they were kids. 
right? And you see, I, I have in quote, they were the best businesses of their race. Um, two uh, white men abducted two black sisters. An 11-year-old um, had to go to a sanitarium. Her 17-year-old. So we see the psychological consequences of rape. Rape uh, is one of the uh, uh, high percentage of people suffer from PTSD after being raped. And some of these instances, and many men were allowed to leave town. Um, I mean, if some of these kids were, were five years or younger. So like I said, some of these folks are still alive. And one of the things that I think we need to do, because a lot of times in these historical newspapers, they publish the children's names. And there's a book where uh, an editor, a woman, an author, actually went and used the kids' names in her book, which was tragic. Because what you're actually doing is you're re-traumatizing a child. So I went through this when I was 11 years old, and now you've published a book with my actual name in it. These children, these women who are now women, really do need to be protected. And using children's names uh, about, you know, things that happened to them when they were young, I think, contributes to the trauma that they've already experienced. And it, and it shouldn't be um, allowed. That's just the way that I see it. So, as I said, words matter. Uh, one of the things that happened during Jim Crow, and we see aspects of it now, there was a certain amount of, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, stealing, the uh, uh, taking people's land. So there's this book, Buried in Bitter Waters, where they talk about this racial cleansing that happened in Georgia in which um, half a dozen surrounding counties in Georgia were burnt to the ground and people's land were stolen. So when we talk about this whole notion of the great migration, it really wasn't a great migration. It was a great expulsion where black folks were actually chased off their land and their lands were stolen. And to a certain degree, I equate that with what's going on with gentrification. We call it gentrification, but what it is is people see it as here again. You know, you come in, you, you take our land, you take our homes, you take our communities, and we're pretty much at a loss to do anything about it. So here we again have this unjust impoverishment and unjust enrichment because, you know, data shows that most people have their wealth in the form of land and home ownership. And so you, you see again here where, where folks of color are losing everything, where you don't have that, that foundation, where you can actually use that those 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 things to 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 weather you know economic you know uh, times when they go bad to to help your child get through college to help your child buy their own home or or anything the loss of land during this time was huge these are a lot of the the counties where and states where racial expulsions took place and a lot of people have proof that they own the land and the, the people that own the land now didn't buy it from them, but there's absolutely nothing that can be done about it, so they say. They can't get their land back for their families. And they have the deeds and everything, but there's nothing that's being done about it. And that's and that's a, a, that's tragic and traumatic for people, okay? So lynching. Um, lynching is something that we know a lot about, but the reason why I wanted to show this because not so much the lynching, but the people who are in the robes. Most of the time, the folks that participated in the Ku Klux Klan were police officers, were judges, were people of, of you know, of a certain degree of social status in these communities, and people knew who these people were. So even though these folks are wrapped in these, these white sheets, people in the community knew who these people were. And in practically every community, even in upstate New York, you can find these trees that they call these lynch hammocks, where there's this nostalgic symbol of terror that people hold in reverence that were actually used as a form to, to traumatize people. There was this genesis that happened where, you know, they these black children were sitting under these, these, these trees and um, there was a big hoo-ha about it because, you know, the white students said that you didn't have the right to sit under the tree. So there's this notion that these trees that are symbols of terror for black folks are absolutely something, hold something different for, for other folks um, uh, in society. Um, uh, this is just the case of many, you know, we, we know what happened to Emmett Till. And this woman talked about the fact 
that any day of the week you could go into these communities and see people's bodies hanging from these trees. And it wasn't always young men. It was, it was, it, it could be girls, families. There was one instance where a whole group of people, including a pregnant woman, you know, was, was lynched on, uh, on these trees. And, um, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you, um, how traumatizing that could be. And some scholars have argued that lynching of yesterday, Jim Crow, is what you see present day where you have police shooting and killing children and, and handcuffing kids and leaving them in the ground and, and letting them lay, you know, uh, on the street for, for hours for people to see. It's the same sort of mentality that it took to take a child uh, and just um, uh, hang them from a tree or beat them up to the point where their mother couldn't recognize uh, their own child. So here we have kind of this contemporary uh, ways in which people see how not much has changed to a certain degree. Some things have changed, but a lot of the ways in which this trauma and people are, are getting exposed to this stuff still gets played out. And resistance is something that, that black folks always did. You know, and I tell my students, Rosa Park didn't just haphazardly not decide to give up her seat on that bus that day. It was something that was planned out. She was very active in the civil rights movement. Uh, they had tried uh, once before to have uh, someone not give up their seat to, to, to um, spark the Montgomery bus boycott. But what we're finding out is one way in which to change the way the system runs is to hit people where they hurt. And that has everything to do with money. And that's what they found out with the Montgomery bus boycott. And we see that Black Lives Matter, um, the, the third book, that you know that I that I'm, that I'm, I'm working on and, and completing is comparing the civil rights movement with the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of similarities, but there are also a lot of differences um, that I'll that I'll show. So here we are. It's more than 53 uh, uh, years later, and we have this intergenerational transmission of trauma. So how does this stuff how does this stuff take place? Um, um, there's uh, a lot of literature on Holocaust survivors, like I said, uh, and in the research on Holocaust survivors, the symptoms nearly parallel with the exception that the trauma is generated from knowledge of the experience, and the secondary trauma is not as severe. But like I said, for African Americans, the secondary symptoms for African Americans will be as severe based on the continuous trauma that they witness, experience, and or hear about. So it's transmitted through the socialization process, watching family members in their interactions, listening to conversations, warning of caution from family members. And there's some worse work being done at Mount Sinai. We'll actually show that there's genetic evidence of transmission of stress-related genes. So it's not just getting transmitted socially. It's getting transmitted in people's DNA, which I think is really huge. Right. And so let me just talk about for a minute why I'm working on this, this fourth book that I'm working on. I have a grandbaby who's uh, seven years old. And what I noticed about her, um, and, and even before that, she is definitely afraid of the police. And um, I remember we were in the car and we were driving, and she's not the only young uh, child of color that I've heard this about. She heard the police sirens, and she started crying hysterically. She's really, really afraid. And it's unfortunate because these young children should be able to call the police when they're in trouble. It's huge ramifications for, for young people. So if you're afraid of the police, then who do you call when you get in trouble? If you're afraid that of the person that's supposed to be protecting you is actually the person that you're afraid of. And this whole notion of dissent and complaining when things happen to you is something that she doesn't feel like she can do or that even any family member can do because of the simple fact that, and I, I use her in here, where she talked about the fact, and I always remember it, that she was afraid and we complained about that service, that that would warrant people coming in and taking our lives. And that's what she's seen, and that's what she believes. And as a sociologist, right, I can try and explain it to her as much as I can. But um, 
what about all the other kids who don't get the benefit of doing that? And what me and my co-author are really trying to do is talk to these kids and bring it to the attention of family members that these children have these feelings. Because unless you talk to kids, and my daughter had no idea that my, that my grandbaby felt that way until I brought it to her attention. So I'm sure there's other kids out there who probably have some of these same feelings. So as in a black community, there is this history of police violence on communities of colors. They may have had robes on, like I said, during the Ku Klux Klan and Jim Crow, but people knew who they were. This trauma is less untreated, which is something that was exhibited in these 60, 70, and 80-year-old people that had interviewed. The trauma was all over them. It was, it was untreated, and it really had in, in, impacted their lives in, in ways that I could not have even imagined. And then we have this intergenerational uh, transmission of trauma coupled with the contemporary trauma that kids are experiencing by watching this stuff on social media and sometimes seeing it in their own everyday lives. You know, and it impacts, this trauma impacts all areas of kids' lives, of cognitive, their cognitive ability, physical, emotional, and their mental health, a child's health later in life, including developing diseases, heart and lung disease, high blood pressure, and other ailments has been well documented. And a child's behavior in school, getting suspended and expelled, and acting out in ways because the processing of, of trauma and fear and all of that stuff that goes along with violence, not just violence from at the hands of police, but even violence within your own communities. One of the sure sign of an oppressed people, and this is pretty classic, is people killing their own in their own community. So when we see in communities where people, you know, are shooting each other and killing each other, it's a classic sign of an oppressed people. So it, it makes sense that that's what would be going on. So these are just some of the, the, the quotes um, uh, that I was just uh, uh, talking about. Um, a four-year-old, uh, in a blink of a moment, the smile on his face changes as he looks out the window, spots a cop car, drops his seat and says, oh, man, Uncle Five O, we, we got to hide. Um, these are kids that don't even know how to read yet, this four-year-old. I mean, that says a lot. I can't read, but I know what I need to do is I see the police. You know, and like I said, my, my grandbaby, we were at a hotel, um, and I was complaining about the service, which I have a tendency to do. I, I accept that, you know, but she was crying and just physically shaken and upset because of the fact that she didn't want the police to come. She said they were going to come, and they were going to kill us. And guess what? I couldn't deny that that could possibly happen. And it made me kind of sick to know that I can only reassure her so much. Because there could be an instance where you could be raising a stink about something and the police could come. And because of the color of your skin, if you made one wrong move, you could end up with a bullet in you. So what, what do we say to, to these, these children? And then this nine-year-old who explains how, you know, they're afraid of the police. You know, I get afraid when I see them kicking down doors. And they're, they're scary to me. So again. These kids are put in a position where they should be able to call the police when something is going on with them, but they can't because they are themselves afraid of what might happen to them. And one of the things that police do, and you'll see over and over and over again, as a justification for doing some of the things they do to children, is they say, you know, you fit the description even though they don't really fit the description, but they use it as a way to have this interaction with children. And the way in which they interact with kids, they say, you know, in one of the videos that you'll see in a minute, they talk about the fact that, you know, well, he's fine, he didn't get hurt or any of that stuff. You might not have physically hurt him, but the hurt to his psychological well-being is something that you might not be able to see, but it's gonna change his life and put it on a different trajectory forever. You traumatize the child. And I think police need to understand that there's got to be a way where they interact with these young folks, which they're not traumatizing them and changing their lives and changing their physical health, health forever. Um, Madison, could you show the, the video for this one for me? I sh yep, I'm going to start switch over to my screen real quick. Okay. Um. 
And so, and while she's doing that, I want to talk about this whole thing of emotional labor. Emotional labor is a form of custody. Um, and it's, it's, it's ways in which young people have, have got to learn how um, to navigate when they're involved in these police, uh, police interactions. You know, what you say, you know, not crying making sure that you're not escalating it to the point where you could actually get hurt. And that's something that folks learn during Jim Crow and their interaction with just about everybody. But young, young children are learned that they have this emotional labor. It takes a lot to really control your emotion and, and being able to understand that you can't act in a way that's going to incite even, even any more possible harm on, on you. Okay. Do I need to do something, Madison? Okay. The kid who dropped it was in all black, and he was calling the other kid in the red and black to come back. He dropped a revolver, you said? Okay. The kid in all black. Yeah. Okay. Was it the group of the, the, all the kids over yeah, there? Yeah, just walked around here, not even five minutes ago. Guys, get on the ground. Keep your hands out. Hey, come over here. Keep your hands where I can see them and get on the ground. Get on the ground. Get on the ground. Okay, Madison, I think that's it. What the woman was saying in the video uh, that you didn't hear was she's saying you've traumatized these kids. And the officer said, well, he's fine. He's not hurt. We didn't physically hurt him. That's but not, that's 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 not, the point the is point that, is that um, um, Dr. Thompson Miller, can you pop, can you mute your computer? It is muted. I think that's your Yeah, mine yeah, is muted. Yeah. Holy smokes. Um, give us just a second, everybody. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Is it behind here? Yeah, mine's yeah. muted. Hello? Hello? Okay. Um, yeah, mine is muted. I don't know what I should do.
Madison. Madison. We can hear you now. Okay, let's not show any more videos. How about that? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. We'll include the additional video in the follow-up materials for you to view. Yeah. Yeah, and so, um, sorry about that, but technology has a way of a mind of its own, I tell you, boy. Listen, so emotional labor that I was just talking about, the, the next video that we were going to show, but we're not going to show, is two officers um, stopped this boy who they said fit the description again of uh, someone that had escaped from this detention center, um, and the boy uh, ran home to his mother. And you can see in the video when you watch it, you know, he's wet his pants, and he has this look on his face um, that clearly is a sign that the boy is being traumatized. The fact that they put these young boys in handcuffs, I mean, we're talking six, seven, eight years old. And I want to bring something to your attention, and it really annoyed me when I saw it. That young man who who shot up uh, the school in Lakeland, Florida, I remember watching the video where the police treated that young man with kid gloves. He didn't have a scratch on him. He, you know, they, they, they helped him get into the police car. They gingerly handled his, his, his head. So we know that the police have the ability to treat these young folks with a certain amount of care and dignity so they're not uh, traumatizing them, but it's not something that gets afforded to children of color. And I think that's something that really needs to be um, needs to be addressed. Um, uh, there was a young man, I can't remember his name, is Jesse, who talked about it at the BET Awards where, you know, police have a way of de-escalating these situations in which children who aren't of color come out unscathed to a certain degree. They're not injured, they're not hurt. And um, that needs to start happening with, 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 with African-American children and other children of color. These are just some uh, incidents of present-day present killing. You know, again, we hear people talking about, just like they did during Jim Crow, that we really tried to protect our children. Um, a lot of the young men get of attention, a lot of attention, but there's a lot of young women and girls that get killed by the police that don't get as much attention. A, a huge number of, of women face some of this stuff, too, just like during Jim Crow. There were women who were lynched as well that didn't get a lot of attention. And there's a new book uh, to talk about, you know, say the names of these people we see, you know, a child as young as seven uh, who was killed. And a lot of these killings actually come from police, you know, mistaken identity, police coming in and, and um, you know, raiding places, having a wrong address, you know, gunfire where the police are killing people, you know, um, unintentionally, but in some cases, uh, it was some of the cases that we've seen where young men are, are killed. Um, and so a few facts of, uh, from mapping police violence. Police have killed um, you know, over 1,000 people in 2017. Black people were 25% of those people killed, despite only being approximately 13% of the population. Uh, black people are three times more likely to be killed by police. But 30% of black people are, are unarmed. Uh, and where you live matters. So it's not so much about the crime. Fewer than one in three people killed were suspected of a violent crime and allegedly armed. And again, there's no uh, there's no accountability. Um, Thirteen of one hundred of the largest U.S. city police departments killed black men at higher rates than the U.S. Uh, uh, murder uh, rate. Uh, so what what can we really do to to help people? Um, uh, less than 9% of African-American children have experienced trauma seek mental health care for their trauma. It's imperative that mental health professionals that are being trained are aware of the importance of intergenerational, intergenerational transmission of trauma and segregation, uh, segregation stress syndrome. Some of the things that we can also do is remove the names of these children that have been raped from new, newspaper databases. Uh, change these time limitation laws on filing uh, rates. Uh, some charges, you know, have been um, uh, where with the Me Too movement, people are having long periods of time, longer periods of time where they can file charges against somebody that uh, rapes them. And then in terms of segregation stress syndrome, prevent like unnecessary violence against young black bodies, even though you know, you, you say that you, you, you're handcuffing a person and it's not really doing anything to hurt them. Like I said, you know, 
it's it's traumatic psychologically, and I, I think the police aren't grasping fully what their interactions with these young kids are doing, and not just with the kids that are actually experiencing it, but the children who are on social media who are watching this stuff on their own, seeing kids who look like them get handcuffed, get beat up, get roughed up by police who are supposed to be there to help protect them. Another thing is, is figuring out ways to prevent violence in communities. Like I said, one classic sign of oppression is committing violence against one's own uh, community members, and we see that quite often. Health professionals, I cannot say this enough, there needs to be a certain amount of cultural competence, learning about history, cultural facts, being able to listen to survivors, and be willing to meet patients where they are in terms of providing assistance. I think that's really that's really key. I remember I, I did a talk at the, the University of Chicago, and one young lady, um, really sweet young girl who was uh, trained to be a clinician, and she mentioned some technique that she thought about using uh, for, 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 for elderly people, you know, who come in and are dealing with mental health issues. And I said that that might work for some people, but when you're talking about folks, especially folks who survived Jim Crow, God and spirituality was used for them. So if you can incorporate something where you're acknowledging the, the, the ways in which that they've coped with stuff, I think that would go a longer way than incorporating stuff that's really foreign to them. You know, like I, I, I tell people, you know, I try to get my mom to meditate, and her, her thing is all I need is my Bible, and that's all I need. And you, you have to respect that and meet people where they are and not where you want them to be. And I think that's pretty huge, right? Um, and we need more research and acknowledgement of this collective and cumulative, you know, segregation stress syndrome, the risk factor for, for, for these kids because they really are at risk. And so what we're doing is we're really creating a generation of young people uh, who are going to be like the people that I interviewed who were in their 70s and 80s who had experienced trauma at a really young age that had gone unaddressed their entire life to the point where, like I said, a lot of them were, were, were crying and shaking and doing all sorts of things that really showed that they had been traumatized and um, and it contributed not just to their mental well-being, but also their physical well-being. And, and I hope that makes sense. So thank you, everybody. Um, I wanted to make sure I got done by a certain time because I did want people to have an opportunity to ask questions, to give me, to give me feedback. Sorry for the technical stuff. <laughs> I tried my best. So um, I'm going to open it up, Madison, for questions now, if, if folks have some. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Thompson Miller. Uh, it, we so appreciate this presentation, folks. I'm uh, scrolling down to our question page, but if you have any questions or comments that you would like to share, we are we currently have about uh, 15 minutes left, so please, uh, we encourage that. Um, and I'm just going to start us off with some that folks have already sent in. Uh, we had someone ask a little bit earlier, um, how does uh, segregation stress syndrome differ from post-slavery syndrome, or is there a difference? That's a really good question, and I, and I know that the post-slavery, um, uh, she did a really good job on that, and I don't, I don't, um, I don't know that, um, uh, well, let me just say this. Um, I think she did her stuff really just based on the dynamics of what was going on. I think they're connected in a lot of different ways, and I would be in this to kind of go through and say, but um, what I will say is, is that segregation stress syndrome, I mean, I think they're connected in a lot of ways. I really do. I think they're just different terms. She talks about slavery. I'm more talking about what's going on right now and really connecting it, in, I think, in meaningful ways to what people have, have talked about and expressed what they did. She's basing her stuff basically on the assumption of what she sees that is happening. Oh, and like I said, uh, she did a really great, great job at what she did. But there, there are some connections in that. There are some, 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 some differences. And it's really based on the ways in which um, I actually use the data to back up what I was saying. And she's making a lot of assumptions based on what she sees play out 
in society, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question here um, asking about, uh, one point mentioned was that oppression uh, might cause violence against one's own community. Can you expand a little bit more on how those are connected? Well, I mean, if, if, you, if you think about it, so if you're an oppressed people, you know that um, you have all this, this stuff. Like you experience violence, you know, social injustice, you know, inequality, um, not being able to really get your foot in and get ahead. So in a society in which you're oppressed, you know that the consequences for attacking and, and pushing back and committing violence against people in your own community isn't going to, in, in several instances, you have to lash out at somebody, right? So you're not going to lash out and express your anger and your frustration uh, and your rage at the folks who are actually oppressing you. Who you're going to go after is people who are in your close vicinity, the people that you live around, people in your community. And part of being oppressed and being in an oppressed group is that the people who are running this shift, so to speak, for lack of a better word, create situations and create an environment where you you know, where they promote you attacking each other because that keeps you, I don't know how to say it, but just saying, like really killing each other and, and, and affords them a way to arrest you and use your body for free labor. So, I, you know, I mean, I can't believe that in a society that we live in that there aren't ways that, you know, the police and community leaders and politicians can't stop some of this violence that's going on in these cities. There's things that they can be done, you know, give people jobs, you know, create programs, uh, go in. Where are people getting these guns from? They don't, they're not just going out and getting these guns. The guns are being provided for them. And all you have to really do is look back at the, the, the influx of drugs during the 1960s and 70s. It, it's, all being, it's all being really orchestrated. You know, and, 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 and like I said, a classic sign of people who are oppressed is that you attack the people who are in your close vicinity. And that's something that's been been, been well documented. Uh, and it's something that has happened, you know, throughout the years. And, and like I said, I know that there's things that, you know, as a society on an institution and structural level that can be done about it, that they, that they choose that is, that they choose not to do because it really does play into the destruction of, of, of black people, you know? And uh, I tell my students all the time, you know, we just have to call things what they are. You know, this, this whole notion of people's human rights being violated is something that doesn't get talked about in the media, but it's something that's going on every day. And um, I think that's a part of the, the, the big picture of it all, being, being oppressed. Thank you. Um, we have another question about uh, implementing uh, this knowledge. So are there any curriculums or toolkits or guidelines to uh, teach about segregation stress syndrome or to train? Yeah. You mentioned medical providers should be trained. So how do you suggest that happen? I, I, really, I really think that when these young folks, these clinicians and people who are going to be psychologists and psychiatrists, are in school, I think it would really behoove uh, these institutions to bring in people of color and have these folks interact with these students, give them an opportunity to really be comfortable and to learn about the history and to talk to people and to really, you know, do some, I don't know how clinicians get trained, but actually give these clinicians an opportunity to get comfortable interacting with people who don't look like them interacting with people from a different generation, really having, you know, you could have a History 101, History 102, where you learn about the history of the true history, right? Uh, James Lowen wrote this book, the, the Lies My Teacher Told Me, where the history of this country gets color-coded into something that's not based in reality. We have students in college and clinicians who are in college who really don't understand the way violence has played out in this country. I think that's a really important aspect of it to really understand the true history and what people have been through so that when people come into your office, you have a sense of who these people are. 
that's really important in 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 being able to respect and empathize with what their lived experience has been and i think i don't think you can do that without incorporating these people into the actual classroom where people come in and when people are having practice um uh you know um clinicians when you know when when you have clients where they actually have clients who have you know that are willing to come in and give these students an opportunity to for, for lack of a better word kind of practice and get comfortable because it's really about the clinician being comfortable with the person that they're dealing with i think that's a huge part of it and that comes along with having that cultural toolkit where you know exactly uh what's going on and to a certain degree who's sitting in front of you and you're not as stressed or you know um feeling like you don't really know what to say or what to do. I think that's huge. I mean, I think it's huge. And I think it's possible and I think it's doable, you know, um, uh, and even have people come in and talk about uh, stuff um, so that people are, that the young, these young folks are aware. Um, I hope that makes that, sense. Yeah, and that answer actually ties into a couple of questions we've gotten about um, working with communities um, trying to provide services yeah. to folks who are mistrustful of the actual uh, sector you represent. So we have someone who works with domestic violence survivors and another person asking about, I work in the healthcare industry, um, how do folks uh, both address the harm that these institutions have done to black uh, people while still trying to provide services for them. So if you're a domestic violence survivor, you might need the police or feel that you need the police, but at the same time, you might be scared of them. So how do you suggest folks work and work that into this? I, I think that as a country, um, it's not going to be easy, but I, I really think that it's something that is imperative that gets done. And I think it comes along with, you know, pol police being held accountable for bad behavior, first of all, um, for lack of a better word. I think it, it, it could, could get played out with people who are, are, you know, victims of domestic violence, you know, being reassured. Like, sometimes when the police come, they don't send somebody from social services with people when there's a domestic violence incident. People don't really have representation, right? Um, reassuring the community that things are being done, you know, to kind of um, repair damage that has been done, you know, on a large scale based upon the history of this country. Um, um, having programs in place where people, you know, police interact with the community in ways that's positive and it's not all just negative. I think those things would go a long way. Having community policing where you know the people in the community and they know you and you've established a certain degree of trust. These things are, are doable things. Um, and so when you go to a place and there's a domestic violence, you kind of have a sense of who these people are to a certain degree. And people aren't afraid that if you call the police, they're not going to come to your house and start shooting people up and kill the person who may be beating you up but doesn't deserve to lose their life because of it. Does, does that make sense? I think it's going to be a lot of work on uh, these these police these policing uh, uh, folks, people who police these communities, getting into the community and really work in the community in meaningful ways that's genuine and not you know not inauthentic. I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, something has to to, to happen, um, uh, and police need to be trained. Um, I think they're working out of this notion that all black people are criminals, and so they come in even with little kids pointing pointing guns at, at, at babies, you know, with, with domestic violence or calls. Those things um, create an environment where people are afraid to call the police, and that really needs to be rectified in a in a huge way. And, um, all I can all I can all I can offer is. It's something that has to really start, and it has to be done in a way that gets a lot of publicity so that people can see that things are being done. Case in point, Ron Emanuel. Ron Emanuel knew that that young man that got shot in the back wasn't, you know, you know, lunging at the police. He was running away. Stuff like that creates an environment where black folks don't trust, you know, people in 
the politicians and they don't trust the police because people lie, you know. So I think, you know, being upright and, uh, and, and really bringing attention to these issues and, and admitting that mistakes have been made and, and uh, committing to, to changing things would, is the first start to, to doing something. But you have to start somewhere. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. And um, folks, I'm going to uh, combine a couple of questions uh, for this next one that we've gotten about parenting uh, in the face of segregation stress syndrome. So we've had a couple of people ask about if you've collected any research or interviews from folks um, who talk about what it's like to parent uh, with segregation stress syndrome or with the fear of the police. And one person in particular uh, asked, if uh, instances of corporal punishment within the family are a response to that. So I spank my children to keep them in line because I'm scared the police will come if they aren't, if they aren't punished properly. So can you give us any uh, thoughts or uh, responses you've gotten uh, from parents in the wake of this? Well, well, well what, what parents, I think parents, do the best that they can with the information that they have. And it doesn't necessarily um, uh, go to corporal punishment, but what it does, what they do do is they sit down and they really school their children on how to interact with police. They actually have books that you can buy. What do you tell your kids when they interact with police? People tell their kids not to wear hoodies because if you wear a hoodie, the police could think that you're doing something you shouldn't be doing and they could come and get you or they could shoot you or hurt you. I mean, stuff like that. So what you're actually trying to do is to try to help your child and protect them and train them, just like folks did back there in Jim Crow. You have to do that. But at the same time, what it actually is doing as well is, you know, creating these risk factors for kids be, but but it's a double-edged sword. You have to do that. I mean, you have to do that emotional work. Like there's an emotional labor that you do in the, the forefront in the public, and then there's, there's that emotional work that you do in the back where you're explaining these kids and explaining the kids, you know, what went on and what happened and how to protect themselves. You have to do that, and that's some of those strategies in which people pass on to their kids. And it's not so much, like I said, you know, damaging your kids. But having these conversations, I mean, in terms of corporal punishment and doing things to them, um, that's interesting that they mentioned corporal punishment. But it really has to do with really schooling your kid and training them to do that emotional labor that they're going to have to do if they interact with the police. It's that emotional stuff to get them to learn how to control what they say, how they move, what they do, everything. Yeah. And. And was it your experience that uh, parents were able to connect this to Jim Crow and, and to a history of trauma? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Some of the folks that I talked to during Jim Crow, they talked about how they see things that they lived through that they thought that they would never see again happening to their grandchildren, you know, with their interactions with police what's going on in the educational system. So these folks, right, are making these connections already and having these conversations with their children and their grandchildren, making connections for them. So, the, I mean, people see it. You know, it, it's unfortunate that on a larger scale that folks aren't making the connections, but black folks are already making these connections and understanding what will happen if they don't train their kids and their grandkids to interact in ways that um, uh, uh, isn't going to end their life. And even all the training that they do in their homes with their kids in the backstage doesn't really guarantee that it's going to keep them safe. It really doesn't. But they've already made these connections. And I did that research with these folks uh, many, many years ago. And things have gotten worse since then. So I can't imagine that people aren't seriously having these conversations with kids because you have to really prepare these children. You know, even though you school them to interact, it doesn't always work to keep them safe. But they're already having these conversations on a really large scale. Right. Yeah. 
Well, folks, um, we are still getting questions coming in, um, but in the interest of respecting uh, your time, uh, we're going to wrap things up here. I will collect these questions, though, and pass them on to uh, Dr. Thompson Miller and have hopefully have some answers for you at our follow up email. Um, thank you so much for joining thank you us. So much uh, for thank you. Yeah, and here is all of our contact information. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. Um, Dr. Thompson Miller has also made herself available and we will provide a recording of this and uh, a copy of the slides for folks as well. So again, thank you so much to Dr. Thompson Miller and to all of you for joining okay. us. All right, thank you so much. Have thank a great you. day now, everybody. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.